Machine gun fire rips through the fuselage. Flames fill the cockpit. The aircraft plummets in a wild spin. But time and again, the pilot of a P-47 Thunderbolt pulls out and keeps on fighting. Over occupied Europe, the Thunderbolt blazed a reputation as the most rugged fighter of World War II, sending nearly 4,000 enemy aircraft down in flames. Now, you're in the cockpit as the P-47 takes on swarms of Nazi fighters. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of the Thunderbolt. June 26, 1943. 48 P-47 Thunderbolts of the 56th Fighter Group breached the airspace of occupied France over Le Treport. Their mission? Protect B-17 bombers on their return trip to England. A young fighter pilot named Robert S. Johnson flies Blue 4 at the tail end of the formation. Like many of the 56th, he's new to combat. Robert S. Johnson was among the earliest pilots assigned to the 56th group. He entered combat uh, flying his first missions in the spring of 1943. 15 miles inland, Johnson spots something at five o'clock high. The tiny specks are directly behind him. It's a formation of 16 Focke Wolf 190s, Germany's most heavily armed single engine fighter. Adrenaline surges. The young pilot calls out the bandits over the radio. The Germans draw closer. Johnson tries the radio again. But before he completes the transmission, the enemy is upon him. just about shot him to pieces. His canopy was perforated. He had an explosive shell explode nearby. It left steel shards in his leg. Metal is ripped. Plexiglass shatters. A machine gun bullet grazes the tip of his nose. Johnson's P-47 plummets from 20,000 feet, spinning out of control. The aircraft shudders and screams. Flames lick exposed skin and swirl inside the cockpit. Most of his instruments were destroyed or damaged. And at that point, Johnson said that he was pretty much resigned to dying. Johnson kicks left rudder to level the wings and pulls back on the stick. Incredibly, the aircraft pulls out of its death spiral, but it may not stay airborne for long. The canopy would only open about six inches and it jammed. He can't get out of the aircraft. Johnson tries to force it open, bracing his feet on the instrument panel. Nothing. He stands, trying to squeeze through the broken canopy frame, but his parachute snags. He began to uh, take stock of the situation. He noticed that the smoke had abated in the cockpit. The fire had gone out from the engine. Through blood-reddened eyes, Johnson scans the skies for any sign of friendly aircraft. He's completely alone. Again, he tries to pound the canopy frame loose. Nothing. 
the Thunderbolt may prove to be his coffin. He's in a, a glide at that point, slowly losing altitude, but still up there pretty good. And he can't get out of the aircraft. Then, at his 4 o'clock, a single aircraft comes into view. It's a yellow-nosed Hawk Wolf 190. His heart sinks. He was intercepted by the German ace, Egon Meyer, who by then had three and a half years of combat and with 66 kills to his credit as of that date, Meyer was a potent, deadly adversary. Egon Meyer closes in for an easy kill. Robert Johnson's only hope for survival rests with his plane. The Thunderbolt's reputation for ruggedness will be put to the test as never before. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was first introduced to the United States Army Air Corps in 1942. The new fighter was designed as an interceptor, meant to strike enemy bombers at high altitude. It was the largest, most powerful single-engine, single-seat plane built by the Allied forces during the war. The P-47 was equipped with one of the iconic aircraft engines of the war, the Pratt & Whitney R-2800, an 18-cylinder radial that pumped out 2,000 horsepower. Wedded to the powerful engine was a turbocharger which gave the P-47 excellent performance at high altitude. The uh, turbo supercharger compresses the ambient air at a given altitude and essentially uh, fools the engine into thinking that it's in a lower altitude because of the denser air being ingested into the engine. And that, in turn, yields greater power proportionate to what would normally be possible in the thinner air up around 25 or 30,000 feet. The airframe was built around the massive engine and the associated ducting required for the turbocharger. Of necessity, this had to be run underneath the engine, which gave the P-47 its characteristic shape and impressive size. They nicknamed it the jug because of its characteristic milk jug profile. If you were to turn it on its end, on its nose, it looked like a jug. The Thunderbolt was built like a tank. Because it's so big, you feel this presence of this large, voracious fighting machine. It really does inspire confidence in a pilot. The Thunderbolt made an ideal gun platform, and so it was equipped with eight 50 caliber machine guns, four in each wing. Eight 50 caliber machine guns was as heavy an armament as any World War II fighter ever had. Fully loaded for combat, the Thunderbolt could weigh over eight tons. The P-47 entered combat over Europe in the spring of 1943. As pilots flew the new fighter into harm's way, one singular quality distinguished it from all others, ruggedness. Its radial engine could take more punishment than an inline, seeing as it wasn't water-cooled, where a bullet in the right place and the radiator could put the engine out. P-47s could lose a cylinder and still come back. 3 8 inch armor plates around the cockpit, a sturdy airframe, and self-sealing fuel tanks all contributed to making the Jug the most durable fighter of World War II. On June 23, 1943, pilot Robert Johnson's life depends on the Jug's ability to absorb punishment. A single Fock Wolf 190 has spotted the wounded Thunderbolt. German ace Egon Meyer maneuvers confidently onto Johnson's 6 o'clock. He cannot get out of the way. He cannot outrun it. He is at the mercy of an enemy who almost surely has no mercy in him. In a futile attempt to postpone the inevitable, Johnson banks to the right. The 190 easily keeps pace. Johnson is helpless. The 
FW-190's nose lights up as Meyer squeezes the trigger. A hail of 7.9 millimeter machine gun bullets pummel the jug. The din is overpowering. Johnson's only defensive maneuver is to alternately hit the rudder pedals to throw off the German's aim. The move causes Meyer to overshoot. For a fleeting moment, Johnson has the upper hand. He fires a burst from his 50 cals. Can't really see him. Canopies covered with oil and hydraulic fluid all over the place. He's got fluid in his eyes. His eyes are burning. But it made him feel good that he could just fire off a couple rounds and show that German pilot that, hey, I can still fight a little bit. Meyer continues a long, slow circle. Johnson can only watch. The 190 effortlessly banks in behind him. But to Johnson's amazement, the 190 pulls up on his wing. Johnson figured that at that point, well, maybe this German is out of ammunition and he's just looking me over. Egon Meyer eyes the battered jug, shakes his head in disbelief, then acknowledges the American pilot with a wave. Bob gave a sigh of relief. He said, OK, the German's letting me go. But Meyer doesn't break off. Johnson realized, oh my god, he's not finished with me yet. The B-47 is punished by another rain of lead. Robert S. Johnson hunches his shoulders inside the armor plate behind his back, praying the Thunderbolt will hold out against the relentless assault. June 26, 1943. Robert S. Johnson's defenseless P-47 has withstood repeated attacks by German FW-190 ace Egon Meyer. Johnson, already wounded and disoriented from another FW encounter, is alone and at the mercy of the German ace. The Thunderbolt shudders under the impact of another burst. Incredulous, Meyer pulls up on Johnson's wing for a second time. The German is determined to finish him off. just starts raking him over, and the German pilot starts generally hitting his rudder, so he's raking 30 caliber fire from wingtip to wingtip. But the designers at Republic had done their job well. The airplane's sturdy aluminum and steel framework shrugs off yet a third salvo. The Fock Wolf again pulls abreast of the Thunderbolt. The German finally really, no kidding, was out of ammunition. Meyer, a top German ace, has been denied his 67th kill. He rocks his wings in salute and banks away. The sky is once again empty as Johnson nurses the battered P-47 over the English Channel. The Thunderbolt is carrying him home. But when he landed the plane, he started counting the bullet holes. By the time he reached 200 without even moving around the aircraft, he gave up. Robert S. Johnson went on to become America's second highest scoring ace of the European theater, with 27 kills in the P-47 Thunderbolt. The winter of 1943 saw waves of B-17s and B-24s beginning to thrust deep into fortress Europe. But the fuel-hungry P-47 lacked the range to escort the bombers all the way to their targets. The Thunderbolt's duties as a bomber escort were slowly taken over by the more fuel-efficient P-51 Mustang. With the addition of the Rolls-Royce Merlin inline engine, 
the P-51 Mustang gained the reputation as America's quintessential dogfighter. The P-51 was a sleek thoroughbred racehorse compared to the P-47's draft horse stamina and brute strength. So in the lead up to the Normandy invasion, a new mission was envisioned for the Thunderbolt. Its ruggedness and heavy armament made it ideal for strafing and dive bombing. The P-47 became the dominant fighter of the 9th Air Force, primarily because it was such an extremely versatile and effective ground attack airplane. Thunderbolt pilots of the 9th Air Force were seldom called on to dogfight. But if attacked, they were more than ready. June 14, 1944, P-47s of the 368th Fighter Group climbed to altitude after attacking German ground positions. 21-year-old Lieutenant George Sutcliffe forms up on his squadron commander, Colonel John Hessler. They are RTB, returned to base. Sutcliffe, his head on a swivel, is the first to spot the danger lurking above. I turned back to take a look. Uh, out of the clouds came a whole gaggle, they call them, a bunch of black things. <clears throat> I thought it looked like a bunch of rats coming out of, the, out of the clouds in back of us. No less than 40 ME-109s are descending on the four Thunderbolts. Our commander's still on the radio, talking to us about looking for targets. He's yakking away, and these I mean, ME-109s are coming up on us pretty quickly. I'm hollering to the uh, squadron commander. I think, break left, Colonel, break left. The ME-109s open fire just as Sutcliffe's frantic calls get through. When he heard me, he broke. He pulled up. I pulled up with him. The Thunderbolts are split up in the frenzy. Sutcliffe squeezes off a burst as a German moves through his windscreen. Some of his 50 caliber rounds strike home. The squadron commander hollered, uh, there's too damn many of these guys. Let's get out of here. Get in the clouds. He had a paddle prop, which was the latest. And the paddle prop was really a benefit in climbing. The wider paddle propeller scoops more air with each rotation, improving the jug's rate of climb. John Hessler and element lead Marv Rossville easily reach the clouds, but George Sutcliffe and Robert Bechtel are left behind. The two Americans are vastly outnumbered. Two jugs versus 40 ME-109s. The ME-109 was the most produced fighter of the war. It was equipped with two 13mm machine guns and one 20mm cannon mounted in the prop hub. The ME-109 turns better, but the P-47 is tougher and heavier, giving it the edge in a dive, but making it slower than the 109 in a climb. Sutcliffe is here. There are too many 109s on all sides of him to make a break for the clouds. He'll try to blast out of the furball and dive for safety. I figured I'm gonna need everything I've got here. I just pushed the throttle and I hit the button for the water injection. And that plane just took right off. It was, it, it was moving pretty good. Water injection was widely used during World War II a limited quantity of water methanol mixture could be injected into the engine cylinders for cooling purposes. The jug's engine howls as he barrels through the furball. I just put my head down. I got down in the cockpit to make myself as small a target as I could. I can remember just peeking over that. Again. I'm going into this bunch of 109. Sutcliffe fires at anything that crosses his flight path. Then pitches down in a steep dive. 
but he can't shake two Messerschmitts that stay on his tail. They were gaining on me. So in my mind, I say, this is stupid. <laughs> I can't get away this way. There's not enough altitude for Sutcliffe to dive away from the ME-109s. His mind races. Someone had indicated that the 109 does not turn as well to the right as it does to the left. I don't know where that came from, but it stuck in my mind. So I started a tight right-hand spiral going up to try to get in the clouds. The tight defensive spiral will prevent the Messerschmitts from putting their gun sights on the Thunderbolt. But Sutcliffe will lose airspeed in the climb, threatening a stall before he reaches the clouds. Sutcliffe pulls hard while hitting right rudder. The Thunderbolt responds smartly. The 109s break off their attack. While in the spiral, Sutcliffe spots the only other jug still in the fight, Robert Bechtold. I saw him, he had a 109 on his tail, and he was getting hit pretty good. And he started to burn, and he bailed out. Now alone and close to stalling, Sutcliffe releases back pressure and levels the wings. There are 20 Messerschmitts orbiting 1,500 feet above him, preventing his run for the clouds. They did get organized, and they had two what we call Luftberries right under the cloud cover, the bottom of the clouds. The Germans have formed two counter-rotating Luftberry circles at 2,000 feet. If Sutcliffe tries to run in any direction, they can easily dive onto his tail and shoot him down. Sutcliffe knows his options are few. Just didn't have enough power to get that 2,000 feet into the cloud layer. The Germans circle overhead. They're hunting as a pack, waiting for their prey to weaken. A grueling battle is about to unfold. June 14, 1944. P-47 Thunderbolt pilot George Sutcliffe is outnumbered and trapped at low level. At least 20 Messerschmitts are blocking his means of escape, a cloud base at 2,000 feet. As Sutcliffe's mind races through his options, a single ME-109 drops from the Luftberry to make a pass. Sutcliffe is here. The 109 is here. Sutcliffe's best option is to make a sudden snap roll to dive for the deck and throw the 109 off his tail. I waited and waited the last split second. I'm sure he was going to go right through me. <laughs> Sutcliffe rolls. Cannon shells rip into his left wing. I'm going for the deck again, head first, and just and I haven't got far to go. <laughs> the dive builds precious airspeed, energy he can convert to altitude to climb ever closer to the clouds. Hard back on the stick. Under the force of six Gs, he's close to blacking out. It's a little harrowing experience. I couldn't see, but I had, you know, just, I don't know what you call it, you know what you're doing. You're not unconscious. Your blood comes back to your eyes and you're just back to normal. Sutcliffe will use the airspeed he's built up in the dive to enter another climbing spiral that will help throw off the Germans' attack runs while getting him nearer the safety of the clouds. So with these tight spirals, I was going pretty fast at the beginning, but with my node almost straight up in a tight turn. I killed all the aerodynamics, so there was no lift. It was just this beautiful big Pratt & Whitney engine that was pulling me and this seven-ton airplane straight up. To prevent a stall, Sutcliffe is forced to level off. 
the moment where he's most vulnerable to attack. I'm starting to level out, hoping I can get into the clouds. And the 109 came down from the left. He was going too fast. The ME-109 overshoots the turn, then does something completely unexpected. He pulled up and slid right into me, just maybe 25, 30 feet away. It was just like flying formation with me. And I could see him clearly, he could see me clearly. He just looked at me and shook his head, and I looked at him, I shook my head. I took it the fact that he was probably saying, there's no way you're going to get out of here. A moment's silent acknowledgement between two warriors, and the fight continues. He was hanging on a stall just like I was, but he started to just come back a little bit so he could get an angle on me. And just as I saw the nose where I felt he's going to let me have it, I pulled up and went right over his canopy. Sutcliffe's hands and feet are a flurry of coordinated action. Full back on the stick, right aileron and rudder. Yet another attack is foiled. He dives for airspeed and again pulls up into a climbing spiral. Another attempt to reach the clouds. I'm flying the old Thunderbolt, which we call a Razorback. Didn't have a bubble canopy, so it was difficult to see directly in back of you. And all of a sudden, traces come by both sides of my canopy. Sutcliffe is here. Another ME-109 is here, in his blind spot. I yanked the stick, I hit the rudder, and I, I did a, a quick snap roll. But he did hit me with that 20 millimeter. The armor plate behind his headrest deflects the blast. It just gave me a jolt, and I was so hepped up, it didn't make much difference. Sutcliffe is forced away from the clouds and into yet another power dive. He pulls back on the stick but the controls are sluggish. The jug has taken some serious hits. I'm pulling back, and man, it's just, I'm having a heck of a lot of trouble getting it. So I wrap my leg around it and put two hands on it to get out of that dive. Sutcliffe barely clears the trees. He's exhausted and drenched in sweat. He's been fighting for his life for 15 minutes. Sutcliffe knows this has to end. I figured the next one I might not be able to pull out. So I was just figured that I'm gonna have to make a run for it. Sutcliffe begins another climbing spiral. This one will be decisive. It's now or never. I looked around again and I didn't see anybody coming at me, so I leveled off and tried to get in the clouds. I'm probably 1,500 feet. I got another 500 feet to go. Another German 109 drops from the Luftberry to attack. Intent on downing the lone P-47 once and for all. The German streaks in full throttle, building up excess speed in the dive. He chops power and throws in left rudder. The move puts him abreast of Sutcliffe's right wing. He pulled in close to me again as we were going up. When I was so close to the clouds, I wasn't about to make any changes. If he's going to get me, he's going to get me, but I was going to go in the cloud. Sutcliffe's engine howls as he claws for altitude. The 109's machine guns inch closer to the Thunderbolt's vulnerable six. It's an all-out race for the clouds. June 14, 1944. P-47 Thunderbolt pilot George Sutcliffe is racing for the safety of a cloud deck. A German ME-109 inches closer to firing position. Sutcliffe teeters on the edge of stall as the turbocharged 2800 radial pulls the seven-ton jug towards safety. After 18 agonizing minutes, George Sutcliffe finally breaks into the clouds, closely flanked by the ME-109. And when we got up, just covered with the clouds, he, he rolled over. I saw his belly roll over and he went out. So I'm thrilled that I'm in the clouds. 
in an incredible display of airmanship, George Sutcliffe has outflown 20 Germans and lived to tell about it. He wings his thunderbolt towards home. I came in. They were surprised to see me. They thought I'd been shot down. I got down and got out of the aircraft. I was exhausted. I was just limp. George Sutcliffe's epic fight is a stunning example of the Thunderbolt's defensive capabilities. But the Jug was a dogfighter at heart. And with eight 50 caliber machine guns, it was more than ready to take the fight to the Germans. December 19, 1944. 16 B-47 Thunderbolts of the 354th Fighter Group cruise into German airspace. Their mission, dive bomb the headquarters of the 116th Panzer Division near Prom. They're led by Captain Kenneth Dahlberg, an ace in the P-51s with 10 kills. He is on his first combat mission in the Thunderbolt. Whereas a lot of the P-47 groups later transitioned to P-51s, the 354th transitioned from a P-51 in late 1944 into P-47s. Dahlberg and his 16 P-47s never arrive at their primary target. They are diverted by ground control to a formation of 30 ME-109s. Dahlberg is here. The ME-109s are here. He will bank left to move in behind the German formation. But as he moves in, Dahlberg spots even more enemy aircraft. 40 ME-109s climbing to join the fight. The Mustang Ace is aggressive, confident his dogfighting prowess will translate to the jug. He prepares for combat. So the first thing that happens, the adrenaline goes up. <laughs> we had to get rid of our bombs, so we just jettisoned our bombs. Unseen, the P-47s approach the enemy formation. Dahlberg and his men pick targets. He closes the range and opens fire with his 850 cows. The trailing ME-109 is shredded. The German pilot bails out. The first one to pick off was pretty easy because they were not aware of us. Now they all turn into us, so they were coming right smack at us. So now it's a game of chicken. Dahlberg and his Thunderbolts barrel through the formation. The dogfight quickly escalates into a wild frenzy. The second formation of ME-109s joins the melee. The skies reverberate with the sound of over 80 fighters maneuvering in violent air combat. There's a lot of screaming on the radios and you could hear distress calls. In the midst of the brawl, Dahlberg picks out a target, an ME-109 just out of range in a descending left turn. Dahlberg snaps to the left and gives chase. He squeezes off several bursts, scoring some hits. But the ME-109 is at the extreme range of his guns. All of a sudden, somebody overshot me. The 109 went by me. He's closer than the other guys, so now I, I, change, I change targets. The ME-109 is expertly flown. Dahlberg can't pull lead to get off a clean shot. But the German does something unusual. He takes the fight into the vertical. The 109 will reverse direction and pitch up. 
Dahlberg climbs up as well. The move initiates a vertical rolling scissors. Each plane claws for altitude, hoping his opponent stalls first. If you're gonna stay on his tail, you've gotta get up and turn around, and he's doing the same thing. So whoever can get the highest without stalling out and get in a position will, will win. Dahlberg's newer model P-47 has an improved engine and a paddle prop. It can match the ME-109 in a climb. They meet at the bottom of the scissors in crushing 5G pullouts. Drive walls start to feel like they're coming out of the sockets, and, and things get hazy sometimes. But it's the balance of maximizing what the body will stand and survival. Dahlberg fights exhaustion and stays aggressive. He's slowly gaining the advantage. As he begins to climb, he cranks his head up, watching as the German makes his move. But this time, his opponent makes a critical mistake. He's loosened his turn. When he turned for the climb up to turn, I got the profile of his whole airplane. Dahlberg fires. A three-second burst unleashes hundreds of rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. A crushing weight of fire impacts the canopy and cockpit of the ME-109. The German plane drops out of the sky. Kill number two. Dahlberg stays alert and picks out the nearest target. It's the only way to fight in the chaos of a furball. Dahlberg's P-47 is here in a descending right turn. The ME-109 is here, 500 feet below. From his position, Dahlberg can easily drop in on the German's tail. He didn't realize I was there. That was a quickie. Dahlberg deftly leads his target and fires. The ME-109 smokes. The pilot throws the canopy back and leaps for safety. It's kill number three. But immediately, Dahlberg's Thunderbolt is enveloped in tracer fire. The tables have turned in an instant. Dahlberg finds himself in the crosshairs of an ME-109, hell-bent on blowing him out of the sky. December 19, 1944. In the midst of a ferocious 80-plane dogfight, Thunderbolt pilot Ken Dahlberg has scored three victories. But now, an ME-109 has the drop on him. He'll have to shake him loose if he wants to get home to celebrate his victories. At that point, and I had to go from an offensive mood to a defensive mood very fast. Dahlberg breaks right out of the stream of tracers, craning his neck around for a glimpse of his attacker. The 109 is on his tail, beginning to pull lead. Dahlberg calls on an ingenious evasive maneuver, a technique called cross-controlling. The rudder pushes the nose left or right. The ailerons roll the airplane. By ruddering one direction and rolling opposite, the Thunderbolt actually skids sideways, making it extremely difficult for the 109 to land strikes. You kick the right rudder all the way in, and then instead of coordinating the stick with the rudder to the right, you put the stick to the left. You change course very, very rapidly. You start going sideways, so his shells will stay out in front of you then. The attack is foiled. 
but Dahlberg is losing critical energy. He relaxes the skid and drops his nose for airspeed. The ME-109 stays with him, lining up another shot. The German fires. Again, Dahlberg skids out of the stream of bullets. When you have the reality that somebody's on your tail, you take every wild maneuver you can do. Dahlberg tries everything to shake the ME-109 from his tail. The German holds fast. Suddenly, tracer fire envelops the 109. He's forced to break off. Maybe one of my buddies was shooting at him or something. I don't know. There was Everybody was shooting at everybody up there. Dahlberg scans the skies for another ME-109. For the first time in seven minutes, he can't find an immediate target. It seemed like instantly they all almost disappeared. Dahlberg forms up with another Thunderbolt. Together, they scan the horizon. In the distance, they spot two 109s trying to slip away. We both had seen a couple of guys that were just kind of stragglers that were apparently leaving, and we poured the coal to it and caught up. The 109s are at a lower altitude. Dahlberg dives after them, easily building up enough speed to pull within gun range. He fires his eight Brownings for the last time that day. The engine smokes. The German pilot bails out. It's Dahlberg's fourth kill, his 14th of the war. Dahlberg gathers the remaining P-47s and prepares for the flight home. Though outnumbered five to one, they've managed to knock out nine enemy aircraft to the loss of three Thunderbolts. On his first combat mission in a P-47, Ken Dahlberg demonstrates perfectly that in the hands of a skilled pilot, the Thunderbolt was every bit as lethal as the P-51 Mustang. The P-47 Thunderbolt was arguably the most significant fighter of the European theater in World War II. I think it's helpful to remember that the P-47, not the Mustang, was the most produced American fighter of all time. About 15,500 Thunderbolts of all types were built from 1941 through 1945. Thunderbolt pilots downed 3,752 enemy aircraft in air-to-air -air combat. On the ground, they destroyed 86,000 railway cars, 9,000 locomotives, and 6,000 armored fighting vehicles during the war. But time and technology caught up with the B-47. By the Korean War, it was phased out of the American Air Force to make way for fighters of the jet age. The P-47 Thunderbolt's legacy lives on in another superb ground attack aircraft, the A-10. In tribute to the P-47, the A-10 was officially named the Thunderbolt II, but is more commonly known as the Warthog. The A-10 can unleash devastating firepower on enemy ground targets with precision guided munitions and an incredibly lethal 30 millimeter cannon. And like its namesake, the A-10 has a reputation for ruggedness. A reputation that resonates with P-47 Thunderbolt pilots when they think of their old war horse. It was the best airplane that, uh, that I ever flew, particularly going to combat. You just felt that thing was going to bring you home. No matter how much it gets shot up, it was going to bring you home.